Intel's autonomous driver assistance company, Mobileye, an Intel company, recently laid the cornerstone for its new global development center in Jerusalem. The cornerstone itself was laid by none other than Israel's Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu. The center is expected to employ some 2,700 people. John Steinberg, the president of news at LTC USA, that's our parent company, recently sat down with the senior director of strategy for Mobileye. Israel Business Weekly here in Jaffa Port in Tel Aviv. I'm John Steinberg. My guest is Gilad Lustig, Senior Director of Strategy at Mobileye. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me, John. Okay, Mobileye, it, it's what lets the cars drive by themselves, right? Actually, Mobileye was formed with the concept of uh, saving lives. Yeah. We started with uh, uh, ADAS, which is uh, Advanced uh, Driving Assistance Systems, which uh, allowed the driver to, to, to perform better. Um, the, the natural step from moving from ADAS, from supporting the driver, is to replace the driver. So our, our plan and our strategy moving forward, of course, is uh, the autonomous space. And Bob Swan, your boss, the, he the head of the Intel, boss boss. the boss of your everybody's boss, everybody's okay? Boss, yeah. He said recently, he, he was over here recently, he saw the technology, he said he was blown away, and he said robo-taxis, robot taxis, yeah. is going to be the first staggering use of your technology. Why is that? Why is robo taxis first? Okay, so and what is a robo taxi? First, a robo taxi is a taxi without a driver. Imagine you order an Uber to your application, and instead of meeting Javier, a 35-year-old uh, gardener, uh, you have a you have a robot coming. Uh, so this is robo taxi, a, a taxi being driven by a robot. Rise robo taxi a stage. Uh, we believe that the end game will be uh, consumer autonomy. In order to meet Consumer autonomy, you have to go through three steps. First, you have to bring the cost down. Currently, the systems are quite expensive. You have multiple sensors and computers. So this is one thing. Second thing is you need to build the regulatory framework. You need to have a, um, a service that can teach both the consumers and the regulators about autonomous vehicles and how to live with them together in, in kind of a mixed environment. And of course, you, you need to find a way to scale um, mapping and, and the infrastructure to allow for consumer autonomy. So this is why robotaxis are a necessary step towards consumer autonomy, which is kind of the end game of this industry. This is such, this is such a classic Israel story. Uh, the technology comes out of Hebrew University, Correct. right? Um, and Hebrew University is very, very liberal in terms of the licensing of technology to become private enterprise. Is that mm -hmm. right? Uh, well, it's 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 it depends on the case, of course. Uh, I think in in our case, of course, all the technology was developed specifically for uh, for the company. Mm -hmm. Of course, um, there's some research that's been done in the university, but I think it, the, the cases differ between uh, uh, companies. I think okay. I think what what separates the, yeah. the Hebrew University is kind of the people that are served there and kind of their free uh, uh, thinking that allows them to really innovate in that space. You guys take the company public on the New York Stock Exchange 2014. Correct. The largest IPO ever of an Israeli technology company. Correct. It's pretty pretty good, right? Yeah, and I, see, I think we also uh, when we once Intel acquired us, it was the largest uh, acquisition in Israel as well. I think it's. Uh, and, and why is computer vision? You know, we've had on the show, um, you know, cannabis companies, space companies, uh, cybersecurity. Um, why why is computer vision such a big thing in in Israel? I think computer vision is uh, one of the fields in, in machine learning that really allows you to have practical implications in the, in the short term. Uh, look at what we do in autonomous vehicles. Using a single camera, we are able to detect uh, most everything that a human can detect. And I think the, the implications or the applications of computer visions allow you to really do the most innovati innovative and cutting edge technologies uh, out there. And that's part of the big innovation I was gonna ask you about. You guys call that mono camera, one camera. Um, you realize that that would be the primary sensor. Why, why is mono camera, I mean, other than being affordable, wouldn't it be better to have five or six cameras? So, uh, it, of course, it depends on the solution. When we look at autonomous vehicles, we have 12 cameras because we need to have a 360 view of the vehicle. Mm -hmm. But when you look at the ADAS market, we look at the mono camera uh, because we, we proved that you can do most things that a driver, a human driver can do with just a single camera. We're able to have a um, measurement of the distance, have a detection of all uh, objects using just one camera. And, for, and ADAS is the Advanced Driver Assistance System. So for Correct. assistance, one camera gets you there. Correct. 
Let's talk about Tesla, which I know is, a, and the only reason, I don't, I'm not bringing it up to give you a hard time. I have my Tesla Model 3. I drive it on semi-autonomous. It's it's magic. It, and it, for most Americans that are watching this show, the most common experience in the U.S. in self-driving or quasi Partial self-driving is probably Tesla. You guys had a falling out with Tesla. The chips are in the current cars, but they will not be in future cars. What happened? Uh, first of all, I think Tesla is a very interesting company. Uh, obviously, uh, I can't relate to anything that happened in the past. I think uh, uh, it's quite common that it's no, known that we're not working together. Yes. I think Tesla is a, a very important leading player in, the, in this space. And I think uh, um, it's, it's good that they have a, such a big company pushing all this kind of concept of autonomy and semi-autonomy to the, to the public, and I think it's good for everybody in the industry. Okay. ADAS is in 40 million vehicles right now. Is that right? Correct. Which automakers are you wor working most closely with? And if a person is super excited about semi-autonomous, um, wants the most cutting-edge and driver-assisted technology, I think Volkswagen is a very close partner, right? Yeah, Volkswagen. B BMW. Yeah, I think uh, we're working with most of, of the, if not all of the uh, large automakers in the in the world. We have a partnership with uh, Volkswagen here in Israel to uh, launch uh, the first commercial uh, mobility as a service solution in Tel Aviv. So this was uh, public and announced. Uh, we are working closely with all the leading automakers. I think since 2007, when we launched our first uh, solution with Volvo, We've been working with all the OEMs in the industry, and, and uh, we have uh, in the Euro NCAP, they give the five-star ratings. So out of the 16 models that got the five-star ratings, we have 75% of them with Mobileye technology. So we are working with practically everybody in the industry. And then what will the consumer see first? Will the, will the, will the typical consumer see the robo-taxi first, and when will that happen? And then how many years are we away from you basically you know, don't need to drive your car? So I think uh, the consumer will see the first uh, robot taxi starting in 2022. This is the, the time that we launch our service in Israel and of course scaling it up globally. Um, I think there's going to be a, f a few years between the launch of robot taxis to full uh, consumer autonomy because the reason I, I mentioned before, I would imagine it will take five to seven years uh, from that time frame to a full uh, consumer autonomy deployment. So that's 2030 then? 2025, 2027, kind of this range. I think it's more of a kind of an adoption regulation-wise and also cost-wise. So I think once those uh, cards fall into place, I think we'll, we'll start how, to see. How has the regulation been here? Because it seems like in the U.S. at least, the regulation around semi-autonomous driving has been, been fairly progressive in mm -hmm. terms of what they've allowed Tesla to do and what have you. Um, how, how is it here? So I think in Israel we innovate not just in technology but also in regulation. I think there's a huge commitment from all the industry players, both technology and I think regulators, uh, to promote uh, regulators because we understand that Israel draws and attracts uh, companies globally uh, and also the, promotes the Israel industry uh, to innovate in this space. I think uh, since our IPO and acquisition, there's many startups working in the auto uh, uh, tech. Uh, I think the regulators are very involved. Uh, we as a company, I think all tech companies, need to find a way for regulators to, to uh, be able to digitize um, the social contract that consumers have. I can give you an example. When, when, when I drove here, I had a dash line and I need to switch lanes. And this is, the, all the regulator uh, tells me that I can switch lanes when the, the line is dashed. He doesn't tell me when to do it, how to do it, should I speed, should I, uh, what actions should I take. And this is exactly the, the kind of negotiation and interactions that in order for regulators to really understand what needs to be done, you, it, you need to digitize it. You can't say I drove much and it's safe. You can't say, uh, believe me, I'm safe. You need to find a way to have a, um, a dialogue with regulators for them to really understand the technology and impact it. It's amazing you bring up lane change because I saw your founder speak at an event in, at uh, the American Friends at Hebrew University did in New York called Nexus Israel. He showed a video of a car trying to change lanes autonomously and what a difficult problem it was because it requires a certain level of aggressiveness to get in and then a certain level of safety to not be too aggressive is is you know i typically think you know turning or making a right or a left to be the most challenging problem is lane change the most challenging computer vision autonomous car problem no i don't think it's the most challenging i think it's one of the challenging because you have you need to have a full comprehension of the, of the environment before doing that i think it's a matter of of negotiation as opposed to taking a right turn when you have kind of if it's a secured right turn you do you do it so essentially the kind of surprises that might occur is is less 
I think when we developed our, our safety concept, which is the RSS, uh, we wanted to make sure that all these negotiation items, whether lane change or driving to occluded areas, are, are digitized and are put in a way that allows us to have a safety envelope and, and really ensure that we can drive as comfort as possible, be aggressive if needed, because it's, yes. it's Israel, otherwise you won't get uh, yes. anywhere. Uh, um, and we have a saying, if you can make it in Jerusalem, you can make it everywhere. Here, by the way, the traffic here, I mean, I, is worse than Manhattan. I mean, it's like every single person here goes out on Saturday night. Like, I mean, the, the entire city goes out for dinner on Saturday it's not, night. It's not just that. Because we are so used to innovation, we also innovate when we drive. We find creative ways to go around places and find... Oh, no, people were parking on sidewalks. I mean, it, it, it's, like a, it's like a bad land here when it comes to driving. Exactly. This is why we, we, we insist to test specifically in Jerusalem. Because, oh. because if, if you drove in Israel, <laughs> Jerusalem is kind of... I, I completely agree with you. Every, every car parking situation and moving should be tested here. How have the Intel execs, uh, how have they handled managing an Israeli company? I mean, that's got to be level 20 on, on the complexity scale, right? I think uh, they're doing an amazing job. The reason I, I can say that is because since the Intel acquisition, we feel that we have kind of a, a thrust and we are moving faster and, 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 and better than we did before. I think we have all the support that we need. I think we have all the, the resources and the facilities in order to propel us to the future. And I think uh, our ability to launch mobility as a service, as a global ser global service in 2022, yeah. is, is well, maybe what it mainly is. I mean, the ways, the, I mean acquisition. the ways acquisition by Google from outward appearances seems very successful as well, too. I mean, there's more Americans using Waze now, more global people using Waze now than ever before. The product seems to be doing great. I mean, maybe part of it is it's so far to get here that the Silicon Valley companies can't actually mess up the companies once they buy them. I mean, is that is that part of the possibility, I don't, I don't think it's a ge geography. I think it's a more uh, of a, a management perception that you need to have such a company working as a, as a, as a division that has to have its uh, independence and its autonomy. When you develop autonomous vehicles, you need to have some level of autonomy. And I think all we, all we are getting is, is support and, and thrust, and I think uh, our results show it. We more than doubled since the Intel acquisition. More than doubled uh, the, the headcount. And, and also the financial results. So I think the, the numbers can speak for themselves.